Boss, is this yours? Hello. My name is Cole Hornaday, and welcome back to The Panel Jumper. Human beings are myth-making creatures. We're hardwired to create meaning for things that don't necessarily deserve it. From blessed virgins and burnt toast to be Arthur's face on the surface of Mars. We see the sacred and the profane everywhere, and it's that creative impulse that gets us into a boatload of trouble. In the early 1970s, Western popular culture was fascinated by the claims made by former Swiss hotel clerk Eric von Doniken in his international bestseller, Chariots of the Gods. Von Doniken postulated that extraterrestrial explorers visited Earth in our Neolithic past, inspiring or even guiding the construction of great archaeological wonders like the pyramids and the giant stone moai of Easter Island. released a lahar of pseudoscience that eventually came under the keen pop culture radar of Jack Kirby, the all-father of American comics. From the days before World War II when he teamed up with creative partner Joe Simon to the Silver Age superhero renaissance fostered through his collaboration with Stan Lee at Marvel, Kirby was forever mining popular consciousness for story ideas. Around the time the Chariots of the Gods touched down on U.S. soil in 1970, Kirby was looking to dissolve his relationship with Marvel and took DC editorial director Carmine Infantino up on his long-standing offer to jump ship. With dreams of better pay and greater creative freedom, Kirby debarked his fourth world epic, a mega-series resonating with Von Donneken's belief that life here began out there. He planned to weave his stories through overlapping books, starting with Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen, The New Gods, Mr. Miracle, and The Forever People. Sadly, what Kirby gave readers was ahead of its time, and his space god stories didn't sell as well as anticipated. Publication of Kirby's fourth world book ceased in 1973, interrupting the comics in mid-story. Chagrined but undaunted, Kirby returned to Marvel in 1975 and continued to probe deeper into the realm of the space gods with his most Bondonican of books, The Eternals, not to mention seeding similar ideas throughout his comic book adaptation of Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Barely, it was the age of the Kirby cosmic. <laughs> Futurist and science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke once asserted, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. It's a concept with which author Roger Zelazny loved to dabble. Published in 1968, Zelazny's novel Lord of Light introduced readers to a mind-boggling technogarchy, ruled by beings with names and attributes taken from the Hindu pantheon and utilizing a technology so advanced they were unto gods. Lord of Light's plot follows the renegade Mahasamatman, or Sam for short, and his efforts to rebel against his fellow gods by delivering their divine technology to the masses. Sam's revolution spans centuries and skips in and out of storylines reminiscent of ancient Sanskrit texts. But through it all, Zelazny's rather cagey with his storytelling, and the reader's never certain if they are visiting a culture in our ancient past or a distant planet far into the future. The book garnered Zelazny a Hugo and Nebula Award and eventually caught the attention of sci-fi and comic book fanatic Barry Ira Geller. Geller was a would-be screenwriter and film producer with a head full of big dreams to rival those of Kirby and Zelazny put together. Purchasing the book rights, Geller adapted his own screenplay and conceived of an outrageous marketing plan. Lord of Light would start life as a theme park. With the help of some deep-pocketed financiers, Geller planned to build an amusement park in Aurora, Colorado he dubbed Science Fiction Land. His strategy was twofold. Park ticket sales would go toward financing the film, while the park environment itself would stand for the film set for Lord of Light. Science Fiction Land would be a futurist world's fair, a sci-fi kaleidoscope where scientists could come together to tout their latest technologies beside giant Ferris wheels and maglev roller coasters, all beneath a mile-high Buckminster Fuller geodesic dome. Geller enlisted luminaries like author Ray Bradbury and designer Paolo Solari to lay the foundations, but he turned to Jack Kirby to design the park's cosmic architecture. And design Kirby did. The projected layout of science fiction land would engulf nearly 200 acres of Colorado prairie land and cost an estimated $500 million to finance. Though Geller's dreams were undoubtedly genuine, by 1979 the world learned the entire project was a scam. 
It turns out Geller's business partners were in cahoots with organized crime and more interested in establishing their own zip code than erecting a utopian amusement park. Geller was exonerated of all wrongdoing, but his investment partner and half the Aurora City Council, including the mayor, met with nearly a dozen felony charges and were ultimately relocated to prison. The science fiction land project disappeared into the mists, and the Lord of Light film adaptation went into eternal turnaround. Or did it? Little did we know that in the late 1970s, Geller's screenplay and Kirby's production art for Science Fiction Land and Lord of Light would help save six innocent lives. Sadly, Kirby would not learn of this in his lifetime. Dateline, November 4, 1979. Followers of the Ayatollah Khomeini gain control of the American Embassy in Tehran, Iran. They take prisoner all inside, save six State Department employees who escape to the safety of the Canadian Embassy. It falls to former CIA disguise section head Tony Mendez to craft a plan to exfiltrate the hostages. Mendez was one incredibly creative G-man, and he enlists the aid of former collaborator, Academy Award-winning makeup artist John Chambers, and together they hatch a plan to enter Iran as a bogus Canadian film company. With no time to fabricate a production from scratch, Chambers digs into his cold option file and pulls out Lord of Light, a property he considers unfilmable and therefore perfect for their needs. With Geller's script and Kirby's production designs in hand, they set about establishing an aura of legitimacy around the film. Mendez retitles the film Argo and slaps together a teaser poster with the tagline, A Cosmic Conflagration. After placing full-page ads in Variety and The Hollywood Reporter, they invite the press to a script reading, complete with actors in silver lame capes and space helmets. They dub their shill company Studio Six Productions, named for the six American hostages. Six hostages Mendez would, in early 1980, deliver from Iran safe and sound. The world knew nothing of this event until the Argo mission was declassified in 1997. Details were not truly substantiated until 10 years later, with the release of CIA documents courtesy of the Freedom of Information Act, followed upon by Joshua Bierman's tell-all piece in Wired magazine. But it wasn't until the 2012 release of Ben Affleck's film Argo that the Lord of Light switcheroo began to wend its way into popular consciousness. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, phew. I thought I was gonna be trapped in this thing forever. Say, how did I get here anyway? Always wondered whatever became of these things. One of my greatest creations, if you ask me. Definitely ahead of its time. Well, that's the problem with putting your work out into the world. You never know what'll become of it or if it'll find its way back to you. Hey, thanks, kid. Nothing. Never mind. Like Maha Samachman, Lord of Light's protagonist, Barry Ira Geller was in love with the notion of leveling the playing field and bringing technology to the people. He turned to one of the greatest comic book creators of all time to help make that dream a reality. Jack Kirby was a true artist and humble genius who labored under a working class sensibility while always keeping his mind open to the stars. Everywhere we look today, we see Kirby's work, if not his influence, in comics, movies, and video games. Had the Argo mission failed, Lord of Light would have been branded the most infamous movie never made. Now Kirby's artwork for the project rests under glass in the American Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. Jack Kirby could illuminate popular consciousness unlike any other, so it's no surprise that his work became a gateway to so many interconnected beliefs, dreams, and possibilities. He'd be the first to tell you he was just an honest guy trying to make an honest buck. But consider what the world would look like if we were all to take our creative energy and give back the way Jack did. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time on The Panel Jumper.
Chagrined but undaunted, Kirby returned to Marvel in 1975 and continued to probe deeper into the realm of the space gods with his... <laughs> <laughs>